Good morning, uh, everybody. I'm uh, glad to be here today to uh, talk to you about uh, EW Scripts uh, and um, you know some of the activity we've had going on recently. Um, before I jump into it, um, I wanted to uh, get started by pausing quickly on the Safe Harbor Disclosure. Um, just to mention that um, the information we're going to review today has uh, been updated for our current view of um, COVID-19 and the impacts it's had on our business. So, you know, as we look at the agenda today, um, what I plan to go over are some updates on how the business has performed as we've exited 2020, uh, a high-level overview of the transformation Scripps has been on the past several years, uh, and then we'll go ahead and take a deeper dive into the ION business and why we think, uh, you know, this has been such an outstanding addition to the Scripps portfolio. First, I want to sh start by sharing kind of our coverage map of the U.S. And, uh, you know, the first thing that jumps out to me is how busy this map is. Um, there's a lot going on on it. This is um, post the ION acquisition. Um, and so what jumps out to me is the scale we now have as you look across the, uh, the country. Um, pairing the ION networks uh, with our other existing national brands and our local media segment creates a national broadcaster with some immense scale. Uh, you know, over the last two years in the local media business, uh, we've doubled down on the, t uh, on the television space, um, acquiring 27 stations in some really terrific markets. Uh, this includes uh, some really high-performing stations and some stations that really were beneficial in terms of our overall political footprint and political map. Uh, this added scale uh, on the local media side has certainly benefited us uh, as we've navigated some choppy waters uh, during the economic downturn of 2020. And on the national side, we can now pair ION's nearly ubiquitous reach uh, with our five extremely successful case networks, as well as our Newsy brand. I would also point out that Scripps is now the largest holder of Spectrum in the country and reaches nearly every American across its brands. I'm not going to go through each of the bullet points uh, on this slide, but I do want to hit on a couple of key items. Uh, first and foremost, Scripps had a really strong year in 2020, despite the challenges brought on uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic. We plan to deliver well over $280 million in free cash flow for the year versus our pre-pandemic range of 225 to 250 million. Uh, so obviously outstanding results given a very challenging year. Record political in 2020, as well as strong retransmission growth uh, and tight cost controls provided all of this upside to help us exceed our original estimates. Um, you know, speaking specifically to Q4, you know, we were, um, we were uh, extremely pleased with uh, the strength we saw in Q4 and how uh, the numbers rolled in, specifically in our core uh, revenue. Um, we saw a nice rebound there um, on the TV side, post-election-related displacement, um, and as a result, saw core revenue, uh, you know, significantly beat our expectations that we had provided going into the quarter. And then on the national brand side, you know, our, our brands Newsy and Cates um, continue to post extremely uh, strong results, uh, you know, a really uh, nice bounce back um, it, from, you know, kind of the Q2, Q3 drops we saw in revenue and, and, sh and actually got to the point of showing year over year growth um, in Q4. The last thing I'll point out on here is that we closed out the year um, by um, finishing or uh, closing on the sale of WPIX, which is our New York station, um, to Mission Broadcasting. Uh, flipping ahead, I want to talk a bit about um, retransmission uh, here. You know, one of the thesis behind RTV station acquisitions um, over the last three years was that a larger footprint would benefit us um, as we entered into negotiations on our MVPD renewals. Uh, in 2020, uh, we negoti renegotiated 42% of our subscriber base, and, and I believe that we benefited greatly from our new larger footprint that we, we were able to bring to the table. Um, as you can see from the chart on the left, um, from 2019 to 2020, there was a significant growth in gross retransmission revenue of about 50% on an as reported basis, uh, and on a pro forma basis that was still north of 30% growth. Our net, our net retrans uh, revenue also saw a nice upside in 2020 and margin expansion on the back of the subscriber renewals um, without any significant affiliate renewals in the year. 
generally the way I would think about it is um, that retrans growth is uh, from one year to the next is really dependent on the cadence of the subscriber renewals versus our affiliate renewals. Uh, the chart on the right uh, actually shows that timing over the next three years of um, our subscriber renewals across the bottom of the, uh, the chart and our affiliate renewals across the top. Turning to political, uh, Scripps is one of the best positioned broadcasters to serve, to serve as a median for political messaging, especially after doubling the size of our footprint over the last three years. And gaining, uh, you know, in that doubling, we also gained, uh, you know, a substantial amount of highly ranked stations in some really key political markets. In 2020, uh, Scripps benefited from this strong presence, or from a strong presence, I should say, in a, in a number of expected presidential swing states, um, and that helped drive Scripps to a record political year of $266 million, significantly exceeding um, prior, uh, you know, prior election cycles. And as we look ahead to 2022, we're already seeing things lining up very favorably for us in terms of our footprint uh, with a significant number of governor races uh, in U.S. Senate races. As you can see there in the slide, 17 governor races in 2022 uh, and 18 U.S. Senate races. So again, we are, uh, we are extremely pleased with the way 2020 uh, wrapped up for us on the political front. And we are um, we're very bullish as we look ahead to 2022. Before I transition over to talk about the ION deal, I wanted to kind of wrap on this enterprise discussion. Uh, you know, this management team laid out a strategy several years ago to gain scale and improve on our operating performance. And over the last three years, this team has been very busy doing exactly that. We've doubled the size of our TV business, which has provided leverage uh, on, in our retrans negotiations. Uh, and we've created a, a much more favorable political footprint. On the national side, our businesses have been growing both their top line revenue and their margin at a significant pace. Uh, and, and so we are doing what we said we would do. And I believe we're you know, very well positioned to continue this path as we move into 2021. Now let's spend a little bit more time delve, uh, diving deeper into the ION acquisition and some of the highlights of that acquisition. Ion Media is a highly performing and extremely attractive brand. We are thrilled to add Ion to the Scripps portfolio, and especially at you know what I believe are the attractive economics that we were able to um, to receive in this deal. Certainly, the timing of the deal during the pandemic you know benefited us on that front. Uh, Ion has uh, strong revenue growth, um, high margins, and uh, and significant cash flow. The combination of ION, Arcade's networks, and Newsy really repositions us um, and repositions the company in the television landscape. You know, we, when we think of ION, we think of it as a, a distribution double threat. It's carried on cable and satellite through, uh, through must carry, while also capitalizing on um, cord cutting and the growth in the free over the air broadcasting space. So let's go ahead now on the subsequent slides and spend a few minutes on each of the growth drivers ahead for ION. First, we'll go ahead and start with uh, a discussion on their reach. So ION today reaches 96% of the US through over-the-air distribution. Um, between this high over-the-air coverage as well as carriage on cable and satellite, um, ION is able to reach almost every American uh, to deliver, to deliver well-known and beloved content. Uh, you know, frankly, after the deal was announced, I was surprised by just how many friends I had from all different parts of the country reach out to congratulate me when they saw uh, news of the deal and to also just tell me how much they enjoyed uh, and their family enjoyed watching ION. Um, I, I will point out that the distribution of this network um, is highly efficient um, with a single national programming stream originating from our from ION Support Center in Florida. And this creates an extremely low cost structure, uh, which is a big driver in the reason why ION has been able to yield um, you know, industry leading margins. As I alluded to earlier, ION has shown some strong revenue growth. Um, as the slide here notes, 6% growth year over year from 2017 to 2019. 
Um, and, and because of the highly efficient cost structure um, that I just uh, talked about, you know, they've been able to generate margins in the low to mid 50% range on a consistent basis. During 20, uh, 2020, ION felt the impacts of the pandemic um, on its top line revenue, no different than uh, you know, everybody in the advertising space. Um, but I would say their business has rebounded well from their low point in Q2. Um, for the year, uh, we expect uh, ION to be down about 10% in 2020 versus 2019. And, and in fact, in Q4, they had gotten back to flat versus the prior year. Um, ION also during 2020 did a phenomenal job of managing their expense structure um, during the revenue downturn. And as a result, they were able to return, uh, able to maintain their margins above 50%. Flipping ahead uh, to talk a bit about ratings. Uh, from a ratings perspective, ION ranks as the fifth most watched broadcast network. Uh, and across network and cable audiences is consistently in the top 10. Um, but where ION has lagged is in terms of their ability to monetize their audience. So looking forward, we see the, the opportunity to drive uh, continued growth in, um, uh, in ION's revenue stream through increasing their revenue yield. Um, you know, this could come through a variety of uh, avenues, including um, introducing some different pricing strategies to maximize their CPMs, um, and also the bundling of ION um, with our other national networks when we go to market. Uh, the creator of the Cates Networks, Jonathan Cates, um, is now the CE COO for uh, our new national networks division. You know, Jonathan and I have spoken in the past about the benefit that he saw uh, as uh, he was able to bundle the five existing Cates Networks and take them to the upfronts. Um, you know, and as we speak, Jonathan and his team are working on utilizing that same approach as we begin to bundle ION in, you know, into the sales opportunities with those Cates networks. This slide is, uh, is just a quick view of the growth we're seeing in over-the-air viewing. You know, the Parks and Associate uh, report that is noted here um, estimates that we'll see a doubling of uh, the over-the-air viewing by uh, 2022. You know, between the ION acquisition as well as the five existing Cates networks, you know, Scripps is really well positioned to benefit from this growth in over-the-air view. So one common question we get a lot is around um, market fragmentation. So, you know, fragmentation is already a very big part of the television landscape. I think, you know, most would attest to that. Um, you know, consumers and um, Consumers have more and more choices all the time, um, and we've been saying for years that we really don't care what pipe it comes through into their home, whether it's cable, whether it's satellite, internet, or over the air. Um, you know what we're seeing is people are putting to get, uh, putting those pipes together uh, to create what we call the new consumer bundle. Uh, when that bundle includes cable, all of our local media brands and our national networks, including Ion, can be found there. And when it's a cord cutter bundle. Uh, we benefit again because we're um, over the air with our local media stations and the Cates, uh, the Cates networks and now ION. You know, I would say we're a perfect pairing to Netflix or Prime or Hulu uh, because we're free and we're easier to find in a cord cutter bundle. You know, there are many ways to create value in TV. Netflix, um, actually just saw this morning, is going to spend 17 to $18 billion a year or 17 to $18 billion in 2021 um, on content, and then they're going to charge people for it. ION pays very little for content. It makes it free, and it's familiar, uh, popular content that doesn't take a lot of energy or effort to find. And we believe people combining their viewing platforms is the future of the ecosystem, and we'll continue to benefit from that. Now I want to touch a bit on the synergies that we disclosed when we first announced this deal. You know, as you can see in the headline there, you know, we estimate $500 million in synergies over the first six years of the deal, getting to a run rate of $120 million. You know, ION was an attractive asset to us because of the tremendous amount of cash it generates, um, you know, its um, ability to be creative to our free cash flow and free cash flow per share, and its adjacency to our largest business, the local media side. Uh, but beyond 
all of those great reasons to pursue this acquisition, Scripps was in a very unique position versus others in our industry uh, to yield a really uh, to yield significant synergies from this deal. Um, as I as I noted earlier, you know we expect the deal to produce more than five hundred million dollars in synergies um, over the first six years. Um, the majority of these synergies are uh, are contractually based. You know, our Kate's networks pays for the uh, today pays for distribution on other broadcaster spectrum. Um, now that we own Ion, uh, we own the distribution channel. Um, and as existing Kate's uh, carriage deals expire, we can migrate those Kate's channels off of other broadcasters over to the Ion networks thereby eliminating a significant spend item um, in the, uh, the case P&L. Um, in addition to these distribution synergies, the deal um, at the bottom of the slide notes, there was also um, assumed corporate synergies. Um, primarily that would be tied to headcount reductions. You know, last week we put out a press release um, and announced that we had already identified 120 jobs that were being eliminated in the first half of this year as we combined ION into our operations. So, you know, I would say we are well on our way to delivering on that portion of the synergies. So, uh, you know, to go ahead and wrap up on ION, you know, we're extremely optimistic about what lies ahead for the new scripts. You know, the ION deal with its, its cash flow generation, um, attractive economics, you know, I, I think it really enhances the enterprise, the broader enterprises um, durability and increases our reach. Um, this is a highly accretive transaction. I kind of referenced this earlier. Um, our free cash flow per share on a pro forma 2020-2021 basis um, is increasing 60% versus if we look at that same metric on a legacy script standalone basis. Um, you know, in addition to the short-term value creation, we believe we'll see, you know, as the largest holder, um, a spectrum holder, I should say, uh, and with our huge national reach, um, Scripps is really well positioned to lead the way in the development of uh, ATSC 3.0 and the future of uh, television view. So with that, Mike, I think that is the end of my presentation if we want to go to some Q&A. All right. Thanks, Jason. I greatly appreciate that. Um, so a couple of questions, and I uh, first want to be able to uh, alert every, the viewers that if you have a question, in the bottom right hand corner, there's a little bubble icon if you want to just press that and then type in your question. I will get to as many questions as I possibly can. So um, I, but I have a few. Uh, we'll go ahead and kick off here myself. Um, so uh, EW Scripps made the extraordinary decision to go ahead and buy Ion uh, Media in the midst of a pandemic, which really kind of raised a lot of eyebrows because no one knew exactly how long the pandemic was going to last. And of course, we saw the economy shuttering and so forth. So how did Ion perform relative to your expectations for in 2020? You indicated that Q4 actually saw a nice little rebound, but um, how did it perform relative to your expectations? And is it on track um, as you look to the momentum that you're seeing in Q4 on track for 2021? Yeah, Mike, so I think, you know, um, I would say Scripps has shown in the past the willingness to flex this balance sheet for the right investment. Uh, and this deal, we believe, is a great deal for many reasons. Um, and uh, I would agree <laughs> toying a deal during tough economic times in the middle of the pandemic is difficult, but, but you know, as I alluded to earlier, I actually think it played into our favor a bit. Um, you know, specific to ION and, and how they're progressing. So, you know, they were down in Q2 of 2020, about 20% versus the prior year. Um, that was, um, you know, I'd say generally in line with what a lot in the media space or the national media space saw. Um, but what we saw was improvement from Q2 to Q3. And then in Q4, they were back to flat um, year over year. Um, and so nice progress there. Um, you know, when we look ahead to 2021, you know, I think there's a general consensus within um, that 2021 is a revealing year for the ad marketplace. Um, and um, in that it probably takes more than one year to fully rebound the pre-pandemic levels. What I can tell you is we've been really pleasantly surprised by what we've seen so far in you know, two weeks post you know, post deal close um, in terms of the 2021 outlook for ION. Frankly, it's better than what we thought it would be when we announced the deal back in September. Um, so, you know, we're, we're optimistic as we go into the year about the pace of rebound uh, and the pace of revenue for ION in 2021. 
in and above and beyond that, I think we have opportunities. I kind of referred to some of them uh, during my presentation. Um, we have some opportunities to, uh, to potentially uh, drive the revenue even higher. Um, and so an example would be, you know, we have a lot of expertise in the direct response advertising space. Um, you know, ION has a very low percentage of their revenue, which is tied to direct response. It's about 15%. So it's kind of like the inverse of what Cates has. Um, we've shown uh, uh, through uh, our results we've delivered in 2020 um, that uh, the direct response category has been extremely resilient and growing. So there may be some things, as an example there, we do in terms of their approach to direct response that drive you know, even more revenue upside than you know, than what we're seeing right now in their outlook. And Jason, can you just expand on that about the direct response? Um, how uh, you had indicated that uh, Kate's performed really well with the direct response during the pandemic. Um, can you just kind of give us a little bit more color on how much direct response you had as maybe a percent of revenues at, at the Kate's networks uh, pre-pandemic and then post-pandemic, just to kind of give us a flavor of how maybe that um, advertising revenue stream has shifted a little bit. And then what are your goals then in terms of looking at direct response for ION? What, what would you like to see in terms of maybe the mix in terms of direct response versus just regular spot advertising? Yeah, so, you know, direct response, you know, is, is uh, as you kind of pointed out there, is a crucial piece of uh, the advertising mix for Cates. Uh, you know, we have five networks there, um, five very different networks within Cates, uh, and the, the mix of direct response to general market advertising varies between them from anywhere from about 50% up to 100% or near 100%. Um, but in general, if you kind of net them all together, it's about, you know, 75% of Cates' you know, revenue stream is tied to direct response. You know, what we've seen, we haven't necessarily seen a material change in that mix pre and post pandemic. Um, what I can tell you though, is that being the largest um, revenue stream within Cates um, has proven to, uh, to be a really uh, strong category during this economic downturn. So Cates, um, you know, for the year is uh, gonna post double digit revenue growth, um, which uh, during a pandemic, which frankly, I think you'd be really, uh, it'd be really tough for you to find another ad based uh, media company who is showing that kind of growth, um, you know, pre uh, pre uh, the pandemic, you know, in Q1 of 2020 and Q4 of 2019, they were showing 30% growth year over year. So um, just really highlights to me the strength of direct response. I think it's still, uh, you know, to be seen, um, you know, exactly, you know, how much we, we shift in terms of the mix within ION. I think that's some of what we're really looking at now. Um, but, um, you know, I think that, uh, that we're, we're optimistic around um, both the Cates business and their growth trajectory, as well as um, what we think ION can accomplish, you know, in 2021 and beyond. Yeah, that performance at Cates has been pretty amazing. Yeah. I know that you outlined uh, in terms of <laughs> the cost reductions uh, opportunities uh, by bringing, um, the, you know, the, car the carriage of, um, over to the I the Cates networks over to the IM platform. Um, but some investors had some questions about the fact that you probably have pretty good channel position on your um, Cates networks with the distribution that you have, and many of the ION. Um, you know, channels are, are UHF, and so they, they're higher up the dial. Is there any um, channel positioning that might um, be a little disruptive, do you think? Or do you think that this is pretty much um, given in the age of cable and so forth, that it's not that big of a deal? But for those that are getting over the air, do you think that there might be a little bit of a disruption on the revenue side? So I, I think First of all, I'd point out is, um, you know, from my standpoint, the over-the-air universe is um, is much smaller, right? It probably resembles more the early days of cable. Um, you know, in most markets, there are, you know, 15 to 20 quality channels that you can find in over-the-air. So discoverability is much easier than um, if you're talking about cable or if you're talking about satellite. Um, certainly, there is some time with the, the adjacent channel and, and the impact we have there, but I would say also say that we consider ION to be an extremely strong broadcast aim. Um, and so we think placing the Gates networks um, next to uh, those, uh, to, to the ION name, you know, yield, can yield benefit. 
Uh, I, I would also say as you look across our existing case footprint, you know, we have channels uh, who are adjacent to a big four. We also have channels who are adjacent to Univision, and we've been able to to drive that business and be successful just, you know, regardless of where that channel, channel placement is. So, I mean, I would say that we, looking at it now and looking ahead to that migration, which will take some time to kind of as contracts roll off uh, to to, uh, be, to um, see that movement, um, we don't really anticipate necessarily any changes in viewership tied to the channel position. Gotcha. And then in terms of um, uh, Comcast, I know that a lot of, you, you mentioned that your net retrans margins are going to actually increase this year. And, and that's, um, you know, what we would expect given that you had already been sp uh, paying for your affiliate um, uh, their network comp, but not getting the benefit from Comcast, but now you have that, um, and so margins are going up. Some would say that you've actually left a lot of money on the table with the negotiations with Comcast. Or as you kind of look forward, would you expect to see just continued improvement in the net retrans margins going forward? Uh, yeah, so, you know, first of all, um, you know, in terms of Comcast, that comes up for renewal in, uh, in a couple of years, in early 23, and, you know, I'll first point backwards to 2020 um, and say that I think that we realize a ton of value in our added scale in 2020. You know, we had, obviously we had the Comcast uh, rate, which reset, um, but we also had three other very large MVP new MVPD renewals represented 42% of our, um, of our overall um, footprint, sub footprint. Um, and that yielded for us, uh, a 31% increase in our gross retrans um, revenue. Um, and so we certainly saw the benefit there. I would also say, you know, you kind of referred back to, um, you know, a couple years back. I, I think we're a vastly different company now than we were three years ago. We have doubled down on the local media side of the business. Um, we've diversified our affiliate base within the local media side of the business. Um, we've obviously grown our national brands quite a bit um, in that time. And, and I think we've gotten to the point where we've become a much more compelling free cash flow story. So while this year and next are a bit quieter on the sub renewal front, if we look ahead two years to 2023, we'll have 70% of our sub base renewing um, at that time. And, and I would expect that drives you know, significant growth in, in our gross and our net retrains. It's what I always liked about EW Scripts and following them over the uh, over the decades has been the fact that you've kind of uh, changed uh, over the years and constantly changing and 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 at the benefit to shareholders. So uh, I appreciate the the change that you bring to the table here. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of um, just if you can give us an update, obviously you had uh, a fourth quarter that had an extraordinary amount of political advertising. That's always that's high margin advertising, and of course you had some investments being made here, uh, support through Berkshire in terms of your IN acquisition. Can you kind of give us um, a, a little bit of lay of the land of where debt, level, debt levels landed um, at the end of the year and what, what you're looking forward to and towards uh, as you go into 2021? Yeah, so, so first of all, I would say Q4 um, from a cash flow that perspective came in better than expected. Um, you know, uh, and uh, that was due to a couple reasons. The biggest reasons being the political revenue we saw, which was uh, which was record uh, political revenue for us, as well as the sale of picks, which closed in the fourth quarter. Um, you know, at that time, we at the end of the, the fourth quarter, we chose not to apply that cash towards our debt, but instead maintain it for the ion transaction close, which we knew was coming. You know, in in the first quarter um, of of uh, 2021, um, at the ion deal close, our our. Um, our cash was $240 million and our total net leverage uh, is five times. Um, that's better than when, when we announced the deal where we thought we'd be. When we announced the deal back in September, I believe we guided to a, a deal close, at deal close, our net leverage being about 5.3 times. So the, the, the really strong performance we saw in the back half of Q3 and in Q4 helped to push us down to a much better place from a, a leverage perspective. Um, you know, looking ahead, you know, certainly I would expect that uh, at the end of Q1, we would look to um, apply cash to um, to our debt balances, uh, excess cash, once we've kind of gone through and figured out, um, you know, our working capital needs for the ION deal close um, and uh, and just gen Scripps general um, needs, uh, cash needs in the quarter. Um, you did mention Berkshire. Um, I know there, uh, there have been some headlines around Berkshire and the filing they did. Um, they did a standard 13G filing, which, uh, which basically says that 
their warrants, which are, uh, they, have, they have warrants for 23.1 million shares, um, that uh, just acknowledging the, the ownership of those warrants because they fall over a certain threshold um, that requires that filing. Um, you know, they haven't exercised those warrants at this time. You know, I, mean, I think that, uh, you know, I, I don't want to speak for, for them, but uh, my assumption is uh, those warrants are at $13 and that they're looking for, you know, a nice move in stock price before they would consider exercising those. So, you know, right now, before the warrants, we have a little over 80 million shares outstanding. Um, so on a fully diluted basis, um, you would add the 23 million shares to that. Um, in terms of our um, diluted EPS, we'll be doing a calculation at the at the end of the first quarter uh, to determine, you know, how much uh, using the Treasury stock method, how much of that actually um, falls into the deleted the diluted um, EPS calculation. Uh, and I think the last question asked was about debt levels. Um, and so at the deal close, we had just under three point eight billion dollars um, in um, in total debt. Great, thank you. And then in terms of, uh, you alluded to the fact that uh, core advertising has been performing a little bit better. Um, I was wondering if you can just put some numbers around that or maybe some color around that. Um, certainly fourth quarter, um, given the, the political amount that you received, it's, there's a lot of noise around the quarter with that heavy political in there. But if you're stripping out um, political, can you just talk a little bit about core, what maybe the, are, you're seeing in terms of the categories um, and maybe the momentum that you see in the first quarter, which, um, of course, when you look at the year earlier uh, quarter, you had the, uh, the Democratic primaries and so forth and a lot of money being spent on Bluebird. Mm -hmm. So kind of give us a sense on what, um, how that is shaping up uh, in the momentum you're seeing there. Yeah, so, so first I want to focus on Q4 before I focus on Q1. Um, and you alluded to political displacement. So I said earlier we did $266 million in political um, which was, uh, again, you know, up from our all-time previous high of $196 million. Um, of that $266 million political, $137 was recognized between October 1st and of the election date. So that is an um, a enormous amount of political in a short window. Obviously, that causes displacement, particularly in those heavy political markets. Um, but what we saw is once we move past the election, a, a very robust rebound in our core um, you know, November and December ended up being our highest core months of the year. Um, and going into the quarter, we had um, guided to be down mid-teens, um, mid uh, inclusive of the displacement we expected. And what I can say is, you know, we are going to, you know, significantly beat um, that guide based on how we shook out for Q4. You know, in terms of categories, you asked about categories, um, when we saw that post-election, you know, bounce, um, services, auto, and home improvement all um, were, um, were strong categories coming out of the election. Um, services, which I like to remind people is our largest category because I think a lot of times people don't realize that, um, was actually up mid-single digits in November and December. Um, automotive was still down a bit, um, but um, compared to where it was earlier in the year where you saw you know, a, a lot of folks reporting you know, auto down greater than 50% in Q2 and Q3, um, just to be down, just to be down a bit, I think, in the quarter is a nice rebound there. Um, and, and retail continues to be a challenged category for us, but what we did, so just based on everything going on within the economy, but we did see it that, you know, tick up from October to November to December. So, uh, so we were, we were pleased with that progress. Uh, in terms of the Q1 comp, um, so certainly Bloomberg spent a lot of money with us. We had just under $19 million in political revenue in Q1, which was kind of unprecedented. Typically, Q1 is a slow, you know, a slow quarter for political in any political year. Um, so that makes sort of a, a net revenue a tough comp for us. But if you really just focus, uh, for me, on the, on the core side, I think that um, we're very pleased with what we're seeing shake out so far in Q1. You know, that momentum we saw in November and December in core has certainly carried over. Um, we've had some really nice pacings the last several weeks in terms of our, um, our bookings. In fact, I would say we have a higher percent of business book now than we typically have at this point in the first quarter. First quarter tends to break kind of late and it's breaking early for us. Um, so um, so I, I'm optimistic about uh, the momentum we saw from Q4 and how it's kind of carried forward into what we're seeing right now in Q1. Thanks, Jason. And um, the Supreme Court obviously has uh, before now decided to take up media uh, deregulation. And so we have a couple of questions about 
your thoughts on the likelihood of uh, broadcast TV reg regulation. Does the company think it's likely that the FCC will allow TV broadcasters to own two of the top four uh, stations in a market? So, so I can speak to that, and then I, I may uh, toss over to Carolyn Michelli, uh, who heads up our investor relations, see if she has anything else to add there. I, I mean, I certainly think we're we're in a, a wait and see uh, mode, like everybody else. Um, you know, I, I think that you know there is a common view that a lot of the regulation, or specifically around the broadcast space, is very outdated and has not kept up with the times. But um, but it also hasn't moved, you know, much. So I, I think it's uh, to me, it's a wait and see. I'm not going to make any speculation about. Um, you know, where I, I think, uh, where I think it will go. Carolyn, do you have anything else to add there? I also would like to not speculate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good to see everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, certainly there's been a number of TV stations that have come on the market. And um, in the past, um, you know, the company has talked about a buy, hold, sell, swap, uh, buy, sell, swap strategy for their mm -hmm. TV stations. I was just wondering if you can just talk a little bit about that prospect um, are with some of the stations that might be on the market uh, today, are they more interesting to you at this point? Are there stations that you would consider selling? Um, what, are, what is your current strategy in terms of your TV ownership at this point? Yes, yeah, so, so the first thing I would say there is that um, we've done a lot of M&A the last three years, obviously two big acquisitions on the local media side, but we've also done you know, some smaller one-off station acquisitions and we're happy with the scale that we currently sit at. Um, you know, we cover on the local media side 25% um, after the, the, the pick sale in New York, 25% of the country. And we think that is a, a, a level that gives us, you know, the leverage we need when we enter into negotiations um, with, um, with the MVPDs. Um, that being said, I mean, I think we, you know, you know we will always look into what's on the market. We will always look at uh, TV and M&A and what's, on, uh, you know, what's out there. But I really think we'd be focused more around the edges, you know, shoring up our local media portfolio, strengthening margins that could play its way out through the buy, sell, swap strategy that you reference. I mean, I think, um, you know, anytime you're able to add, you know, a second station, um, you know, if you, you know, whether it's a, you know, a CW in an existing market, as an example, you can drive more margin, you can drive more efficiency. So we, we would look at opportunities, but, um, but, I think we were not where we were a couple of years ago, where we were actively seeking um, uh, local media expansion because we didn't feel like we had sufficient scale. We feel like we have sufficient scale, so anything we're going now would be um, kind of shoring up around the edges. And it seems like the company is operating in two lanes right now with uh, the TV broadcast and then all the OTT platforms. <laughs> How does Triton fit into that uh, plat the, your your mix at this point? So, I mean, Triton is a business that uh, has uh, has done really well in the, the few years we've owned it. Um, it makes, uh, you know, a nice, uh, certainly generates a nice profit margin, um, and it's had good revenue growth. Um, and so we've benefited from that um, in, in our P&L, uh, certainly. Um, you know, I think there are, there uh, obviously with the, with the Stitcher sale, um, you know, there is maybe less adjacency, but, you know, we still find it to be, you know, a, a, a solid business, a growing business. Um, and one that is looking at measurement that may be, you know, that may have some some uh, adjacency to to the space we still play in. The only other uh, uh, business that we didn't talk about is Newsy. I was just wondering, in terms of, you know, we at, at one point looked at cable distribution and a, as a as a platform yeah. and so forth. What is the strategy with uh, growing Newsy at this point? So I think from a newsy standpoint, um, you know, while we still, you know, we still have uh, a, a decent sized footprint on cable, um, you know, I, I think that what's been a real growth engine for newsy the last several years and what's allowed them to have, you know, significant double digit growth has really been on the OTT space. So I think that will continue to be a focus for us. Um, and some of that is, is around the audience. You know, newsy tends to be a younger skewing audience. Um, it is easier to capture that audience on on your OTT platforms, that's where the younger audience typically is. Um, and so I think that um, that while we, we will continue to, to maintain our cable footprint, um, that uh, when we look forward in terms of the real growth opportunities, it's more on the OTT side. Well, Jason and Carolyn, that's all that we have time for. I greatly appreciate you participating in our conference this year. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Good to see you. Good to see you. Take care.